My guest today on the Play It Brave podcast is my dear friend, Dr. Chelsea Shields. And yes, I love saying that she's a doctor because I knew her for the whole time that she was getting her doctorate and saw how hard she worked. She has over four degrees in anthropology. She has studied cultures. She loves to study the in-depth of culture, fashion, brands, brand building. And that's what she spends her time doing now is really helping brands create something memorable, iconic, and a business that will last forever, for a lifetime. So many creative businesses fail within the first two to three years. And Chelsea is going to give us five ways, five, well, she's going to talk through five mistakes that brands are making that they need to stop making so that they can build a structure and a foundation to last. And I always talk to my creatives out there. I always talk to you because you are here building a business that you love in a world that sometimes feels like you are inundated left and right from people trying to do exactly what you're doing. I know that's one of the number one problems that I always face. What do, what do, what do I do with this saturated market? And Chelsea is going to dive in with us as we both share real life stories and examples, me about my photography business, her about working with huge businesses such as Toyota, and how brands all have these five mistakes that they make in common, and how you can make sure you take the right steps so that you can build a brand that is meant to last, to provide good things out into the world, and to give you the business, and the life that you dream of. You're listening to the Play It Brave podcast. Join Darcy for a wild rummage around in her wit and wisdom. She's a photographer, an educator, and a marketing ninja. Each week, she's going to be teaching you all about creating a life full of mindset, money, and marketing miracles. Listen to real-world experiences and surefire strategies from expert guests, all to keep you focused on your path to success. Think less hand-holding or fist bumps. So stop playing safe. It's time to start playing it brave. Here's your host, Darcy Benincosa. So welcome, Chelsea, my dear friend, and also someone who has given me so much knowledge about how to brand how to be a strong, badass woman in business, how to live my life with adventure and intelligence and impact. I'm so excited to have you here. You are a branding ninja, and that is what my listeners need. Well, I am so thrilled to be here. I look up to you just as much, girl. Uh, I am. I want to. I know that you and I are kind of those no bullshit, get to the point, let's have clear takeaways from our time together. So, when you and I were discussing what we can really give value to all the listeners out there, we thought let's dive into the five biggest mistakes that brands are making on every single level. And you are kind of an expert at coming in and remodeling a brand. Is that how you would describe it? I don't know. Remodeling. I'm remodeling the house right now. So everything is about remodeling to me, making it better, more beautiful, more approachable, more aesthetic. I feel like you're, you're the brand doctor. Right. So I do, I go into brands that have already been established and rebrand them in a way that will have a bigger impact with their target market. Or I I consult with people at the very beginning of a brand to say, who is your market? Let's do some competitive research. Let's figure out where you could have the biggest splash in the biggest ocean, right? That has the least competition. You could really own and drive forward that meets your business strategy. So my job is a lot of strategy. It's different than a design brand. So I look at branding in a couple ways. There's people who approach it from a design perspective and I work with them on a daily basis, they are really hitting on that look and feel, the aesthetics, right? The story. What I do is more of the strategic part. It's what people consider boring, but it's really the bedrock. It's how Mm -hmm. we uncover what story you should be telling or what what three words you should be emphasizing in every talking point, right? It's the strategy part. That's where we do the hard work of Let's research all your main competitors. What are they saying? How are you different? Let's research everything you are doing. Is there anything you're doing that's different than everyone else that you could really own and that you could really magnify? Let's figure out where there's opportunity with your target market where they can really grasp onto something that no one else is offering them. Mm. So you're looking at branding from a very strategic place. What you have to offer, 
what your competition is offering and what your target customers need. Mm -hmm. And so through those three lenses, we do a ton of research. We do a ton of work to figure out strategically what is the best place that you should be in. And then what I do is I then work with designers and I work with all the creatives to say, okay, how do we make this visual? Because people don't respond to words as much as they do to visuals. Exactly. People don't respond to visuals as much as they do to a brand. And people don't realize that. The Nike swoosh has more effect than 10 pictures. So, mm -hmm. so think of it. I like to tell people about branding this way. You know, if people say a picture is worth a thousand words, then a brand is worth a million words mm. because that, that brand now stands for 10 million things. So I'm actually approaching branding from an anthropology perspective. I'm an anthropology professor, has four degrees in anthropology. <laughs> and yeah. what I do is I always approach it from that perspective. And what we know in anthropology is that symbolic information travels faster than concrete mm -hmm. information. So if oh, I were to tell that. Darcy, how are you? That's concrete. Now she has to think about those three words, right? But if I were to send her a meme that's displaying emotion, that she gets that emotion. That's why kids are sending memes to each other all the time. Mm -hmm. We can relate on a deeper level, not what we think, but how we feel. And so we automatically feel closer. And that's what brands are doing. Really good brands that understand branding are getting to that feel space quicker. They're helping you understand what they do faster. And they're helping you realize that they're better than their competition in some way that you remember. And that's I, what brands need to do. I love that so much. And one of the things that I encourage my listeners is one to understand branding is not just the visuals. So many creatives just go straight to logo colors and they forget the foundation. What you're talking about is the foundation to me. I also think a lot of my listeners are women that they think, oh, this is just a cute little business. It's just a cute little photography business I'm trying to do. And they don't give it the time and attention to give it the legs to grow, you know, to give it the legs to stand on. And that's one thing I did at the very beginning of my business is consult a brand strategist and is to consult somebody who can understand the symbolic, you know, things that I am going to create. So, all right. So what do you think is the first mistake that people make when they're trying to form a brand? So the first mistake that everyone makes, and I'm talking everyone, I've worked with everyone from Toyota and Lexus down to like every MLM in Utah. Utah um, There's a lot of MLMs state. in Utah, guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, it doesn't matter how big or small you are, every brand makes this mistake. And it's really, you can see the transition of human knowledge just by looking at this mistake. And the mistake is that brands make it about themselves not about the customers. Mm -hmm. And so Marty Neumeyer, a really good branding expert, he wrote the book, The Brand Gap. Which I it, love. I, I love that book. Often. Yes. And in that book, the thing that I pull out from that book that I say in every presentation I do is a brand isn't what you say it is. A brand is what they say it is. And mm -hmm. that's the hardest part for a company. A company wants to be able to decide on it perspective, produce marketing content, push it into the world, and then have that perspective be adopted by its users. That is the ideal from a, 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 a business perspective, right? Mm -hmm. What ends up happening is when you get into the human element, things get washy. <laughs> what you think might not be what they think, right? And so what we've learned in branding is it doesn't work that way. This one-sided approach to branding kind of doesn't work where I say what I want to be as a brand and I push it on you. What we're discovering is that brands create stories, Brands create identities. People adopt to brands in ways that we never understood. So think about like one quick example of a case study. Think about Ralph Lauren and Polo. Mm -hmm. So he developed this entire brand. And what he didn't anticipate is that it would be adopted by a lot of urban um, rappers who who took the polo symbol, the polo shirt, the polo icon, the polo graphics, the polo brand recognition as a way to establish, like, I'm making money now, I'm making wealth. Now, they could have never anticipated that that thing would have happened, right? Right, right but they were ready when it happened and they were able to transition. And that's what I mean by brands is you can't, you can decide who you want to be. You cannot decide how the customers will understand that and use that. Mm -hmm. And that's where people struggle the most is they want to control how their image is seen. 
And, you know, the, the only advice I can give to people is, you know, that's how we used to develop websites. We our global nab of websites. I know this is a little boring, but it will help people developing their own website. So our global nab of websites used to be how the business was organized, right? There's HR, there's creative, there's sales, there's whatever. And people soon realized this is how we organize ourselves. This is not how humans come to our website and totally. what they need. So it's this whole transition, you know, 25 years ago plus of human centered design. Use User research, user experience. You know, this has taken a huge effort in the last 20 years. And that's what I do most of my research in is on the user experience. And what we've learned in these two decades is that no one comes to your website to see how you organize yourself. Mm. It's not a directory. <laughs> it's not a how you how you're an org chart. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we got rid of that. The brands that are doing websites well, we have no idea how you organize yourself. Now we approach websites because we know they're more effective from the user experience. What does the user need? How do we get them to what they need quickest? Google is the single best example of that. A simple search bar because it's about them, not about us. Right. Yeah. It's letting go, go of that control. So that's the first thing I would tell a brand. It's about them, not about you. Mm -hmm. So the only takeaways from that is understand your, us, your customer, understand what they think. If you're a previous brand, go out and do research. What do they think of you? Are you bold? Are you secure? Are you fun? Are you serious? Right? What do they think of you? How is your brand hitting? You might not have known that your design, your logo, your colors, your messaging would have attracted this unique group of people, but it did. Right? And so either figure out who your customers are or figure out who your customers should be. Mm -hmm. And then create a brand that really resonates with them. And so that's the first lesson the biggest mistake brands make is they always make it about themselves and what they want to say when really a brand is what lives in the hearts and minds of others. One of the things that I have um, in my team is every month we look at what are the most what are the pages people are actually interacting with? Let's figure out how to make them even more usable. And what are the pages nobody has even clicked on at all because they're obviously not resonating or they're not being found or it's not part of the user experience or it's not anything like that. And I think people very rarely look to their own website to give them the analytics that they need to see how are people interacting with them. And how fast are they leaving and how long are they staying? Absolutely. And I think yeah. that comes down to a little bit of ego. I got to be honest, like as a female in the industry that's run by men, um, what I've seen is the biggest downside is ego. The ego is I want, to, I want to cram information that I think is important down people's brains. And then we look at Google Analytics, even as simple as Google, like that's not even high level analytics, right? Yeah. <laughs> and what we find is people don't want that. Yeah. So do you want to keep cramming or do you want to actually create a product or information that your users want to listen to? Why are you doing this? Yeah. And that's yeah. where we see the difference between people who want to just do their, they want to headstrong, you know, they mm -hmm. want to headstrong their brand through or people who are listening to the consumer and agilely responding as they get feedback. It's so true. I mean, I really wanted to talk more about meditation in my business and money. And when I was pushing those things, they were falling flat. But every time I talk about marketing, because I'm such a smart marketer, that's what they want. I'm like, okay, I got to listen. <laughs> like I have to put this content out. I may want to talk more about meditation, but that is not how I structure my business. That's not what I'm known for. That's not what people are coming to me for. They're coming for very solid marketing advice on how to structure their businesses. So, all right. Yeah. You got to listen to it. Then you just go take a meditation class and fulfill your needs somewhere else, which is what I do. I'm like, okay, I'm not going to do that on this platform. I'm going to go have fun and it doesn't have to be a business, you know, right. I'm go do meditation. Right and money building with other people. Okay, number two, what's the second biggest mistake people make? Well, it kind of aligns with just what you said. Um, the second biggest mistake that people make is they're not bold enough and they're not narrow enough. So what I mean by that is people want to be everything to everyone. And yes. literally the biggest mistake other than making your brand about you and not them, the second biggest mistake, and this I almost made this my first because it's that important, is you cannot be everything to everyone. Mm -hmm. If you're everything to everyone, you're nothing to no one. 
Like mm-hmm. just like lock that phrase in your brain. Because if you're everything, Darcy, if you do everything out there from marketing to meditation to whatever, whatever, when I think of you, I don't actually know what you do. You do too much that my brain cannot, it's not sticky. It's not resonant. I'm not mm-hmm. able to lock it and be like, oh, Darcy, she does X, Y, and Z, and I will get, you know, A, B, and C, and here's what it's about. Humans want simplification. Mm -hmm. Just like a stereotype makes us feel comfortable. I know stereotypes are bad, but this is what I teach in Anthropology 101. Stereotypes are not a good thing. We don't recommend them. I don't want you to do them, (laughs) but they exist for a reason. Let's not look at it from a should we or should we not. It's the stereotypes have evolved over human social evolution. Why do they exist? Because we can understand a lot of information really quickly. Yeah. And that's what a brand is. Mm-hmm. And it's not it's taking apart the ego and the humanness from a brand and saying, look, you represent a lot of things and you have to communicate that really simply. And if you're trying to be everything, it's like a, a someone ro- showing up to a party in like writing crops and a and a you know, a crazy wrap hoodie and then like a flat top um cap and like think of and, and cowboy boots. And like, think of all these contrasting outfits that someone mm-hmm. could wear from head to toe. They show up at a party. You're like, I have no idea who this person is. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh, it totally and you're like, I don't sense. trust them. I don't know them. I'm just confused. I don't know how to start a conversation. I'm not going to purchase anything. Exactly. <laughs> Whereas you show up and you're the Western cowboy or you're the prima donna or you're the, the rapper or whatever. I get you. I see you. I get you. I know who you are. I know what you will provide. I know what I want. And I know that's a kind of crass way to say it, but that's how our brains work. This is just Mm -hmm. being honest about Mm -hmm. that's how our brains work to distill information as quickly as possibly. So you can't be everything to everyone. So the number two mistake is that brands aren't bold enough or narrow enough. And what that Mm -hmm. means is figure out what you do well and have it be less than a sentence. It's hard. I know I do it with companies all the time. I get paid good money to do this. Figure out what you do well, have it be less than a sentence and never vary. Mm, it's so be hard. Bold. For they be want to do bold. Yeah. But be bold about it. That's my other thing is everyone thinks, oh, branding, I don't want to narrow. They're really hesitant to narrow. And then once they narrow, brands are really hesitant to push it all the way. Can you give us an example of somebody who you feel is a very bold brand who's like pushing their one thing? So X insurance, I know this is kind of a boring industry. (laughs) Insurance (laughs) industries have have really changed. And I think they're a really interesting example for branding. So insurance industries used to always promote safety. So they'd be like, your kids, they'd show a car accident with kids and they'd be like, oh, you need insurance. It's the most important thing. The idea was if you understand how important insurance is, you'll buy it. Mm -hmm. What they realized, especially in like the climate of the 2010s beyond where we're all exhausted exhausted politically and socially and emotionally is that no insurance companies like that last. So they mm. started being funny and they started mm. humanizing their products. So humanizing was progressive with flow, right? Oh, funny yeah. is Geico. Geico started being funny and quirky with like what well, all their quirky commercials. Uh, Liberty Mutual now has an emo with some spokesman with a mustache. Like insurance companies have begun to be weird in order to attract your information. Well, the insurance company that I think is doing it really well that has a really bold perspective and is not being shy is called X Insurance. Hmm. And they basically are the insurance for the uninsured. So they insure fire breathers and rock climbers and side divers <laughs> and They like took this bold approach of we insure people that no one else insures and they've gone hardcore and they haven't stopped. And here's a brand that was nothing. No, they were EIB insurance before a couple years ago. No one knew who they were. And now they're this big insurance company. And that's a brand that I feel like had a narrow perspective. We insure people who no one else insures. That's Mm -hmm. one sentence. And then two, they went bold on their website. They show UFC fighters and rock climbers. And like they have this hero image. That's the whole front scroll of their website Mm -hmm. of all these kind of dangerous activities that we would think would be uninsurable. And they're like, we insure this period. It's simple. It's clear. It's narrow. It's bold. And Mm -hmm. that's what you need to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love it. Ooh, this is so good. Okay. Mistake number three. 
Okay, mistake number three is people try to appeal to your logic, not your emotion. Mm. And this is the biological anthropologist in me. I do a lot of courses on this, which is humans don't actually respond emo- logically first. They respond emotionally first. So mm-hmm. our limbic brain, the reptilian brain, the limbic brain, which processes emotions, that we process that first before it goes into our frontal brain, which is our executive processing. So we usually use logic to explain why we feel a certain way, but we feel a certain way before we explain it. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. A lot of brands try to logically appeal to you. And what we're finding is that humans respond to emotion first. And so that's the key is you have to evoke an emotion. And what we know for marketing is that different emotions basically trigger or, or can predict certain behavioral responses. So like sadness can predict uh, generosity. If you can convey sadness in a commercial. So think about the commercials in Africa with the little poor, um, you know, village child with a um, fly on his eye, mm-hmm. you know, send money now. So if we can convey or evoke the emotion of sadness, it actually triggers generosity. Mm-hmm. However, if we can convey an emotion of anger, if we can get people angry. So think of any like political types of commercials. We can actually get people to act. So Mm -hmm. what we know from marketing is we have some pretty good research on what emotions will trigger what predictive behavioral outcomes in the audiences that we want to trigger. And so that's part of your job as a brand is to decide what behaviors do I want my audience to do after this campaign or this commercial or this product launch? What do I want them to do? Do I want them to act? Do I want them to donate? Do I want them to believe? What is the behavior that we want? And then take it a step back and figure out what emotion do we need to convey? And to me, those are the most successful campaigns. So Mm -hmm. number three branding mistake is that you don't think about emotions. And I think that that should be the primary thing you think about is what action do you want them to do? What emotion triggers that action? And how do we convey that emotion in everything we do? Yeah. Some things that I see, like when people are selling workshops and a lot of these listeners will sell workshops or, you know, photography packages or whatever. And what I find them doing is they're trying to make a list of everything they get. You get this much time and you get this many prints and you get this thing and this thing. And, and I always think that list is not what's going to sell them. It might, uh, you know, push them into like, yeah, and now I see that value. But if they don't feel the emotion first, before they see the checklist of what comes, or you don't have a little like, you know, you have those emotions you want them to feel, what would you have somebody do if they wanted, you know, do you have any good advice for photographers who are trying to show these images of connected people? I always say, you know, I always use this phrase of like, don't let your children's lives pass by only documented on an iPhone. You know, like I try and invoke guilt. (laughs) Like mother's guilt. <laughs> right, right, right. It's like a mother is going to feel guilty. That's actually good. It's if very her smart. Child <laughs> is only documented poorly by her on an iPhone and she doesn't even back that iPhone up. Like, don't let your child's whole childhood disappear. So I always thought if I can make the mom feel guilty enough about not doing this, <laughs> Is, but see, some people think it totally that's works. Speculative, no. But I think it's just smart marketing and understanding a mindset. Well, and that's something we need to do a little caveat about feminist caveat, which Mm -hmm. is as I've been in this industry, I have gotten that a lot. This is emotional manipulation. This is, you know, coercive control. This is how humans, especially men, have been literally controlling marketing, advertising products for years. Us understanding, (laughs) I just want people to understand the process and utilize it for their own good. It's not good or bad, it's smart tactics to accomplish a goal. And where I always look at is like, am I trying to get everybody to invest in plastic or am I trying to get people to document their lives and have beautiful photos and enrich themselves? Like every product that I promote, I fully a million percent believe it makes the world a better place. I love it. Absolutely. So I, it is my responsibility to then help people improve their lives through smart marketing. I completely agree. 
Awesome. And I think that, that, you know, back to your question of like, how could we pitch this? This is just off the top of my head, but guilt works. Mm -hmm. Another thing that works is like an idea of some memories are just too good not to last. Mm -hmm. Like that simple, you know, it's those simple of concepts. Nostalgia. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Like, and you show that first kiss or that first wedding dance or the dad dying on the, you know, some memories are just too good not to be captured the right way. You know, and you show an iPhone picture versus a photographic editorial picture and it's different. And like, you can convey that, that you can convey that emotion in a million different ways, but as long as you get that emotion across, you're going to get action. And that's kind of number three. That's the big deal is if you just do logic, you'll convey information. You'll be Mm -hmm. like, think about yourself as a library. Like Mm -hmm. you'll convey information. People will understand their learn their grow. But if you get emotion, you'll change action. Now think of yourself as an Amazon. Now we're getting an actual conversion. We're getting a product that's being purchased, right? So the second emotion is implemented, humans tend to act. And so that's where we talk about the conversion funnel in marketing is Yes, you want to convey what you do and how you do it and how you're different and your value prop. And we want to convey all of that stuff, right? But if we don't have the emotion there, people aren't going to act. They're just Mm -hmm. going to know who you are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And action, your job as a business is getting people to take action. Otherwise, you won't be in business (laughs) for very long. Okay, number four. Number four is distillation. Um, Brands really struggle with distilling their content and their information and who they are and what they are down to what I call the least common denominator. So think Mm. back all the way to like high school and fractions. (laughs) How far can we take it down? That was the mission. And that's what I do with brands. So when I'm with a big brand and, you know, big enterprise brand, we're working on a rebrand or we're working on a new brand or a sub brand. We're in the room and the whole time I'm in the room, I'm distilling distilling. Mm-hmm. How can we say that shorter? How can mm-hmm. we say that quicker? How can we say that more effectively? How can we say that in two words or less? How can we say it in a visual, not even words? So that distillation process is really important. And this has less to do with branding than it has to do with the e- ecology and the environment in which our branding is taking place. So because the market is so oversaturated in digital right now, Mm -hmm. you have to be so distilled and so bold to even make a little ripple effect in what is the common world of, of social media today right? Or, or e-commerce today or digital commerce today. It's just so overwhelming. People are becoming a little bit blinded. So if you do everything to everyone, if it's about you, if there's no emotion, you're just, you're just going to be filtered. Your brain is sorry. People are just going to filter you. It's just too much of a saturated market. And so branding, that's the one key thing I want to mention is branding is not universal principles from now until eternity. It depends on the market we're in. Mm-hmm. And that's important. Depending on the market you're in, if it's super oversaturated, you have to become more narrow and you have to become more bold. If your market is pretty wide open, great. We can have a little bit of a wider base and we can have a little more euphemistic proposition. So it does depend on the market you're going into. But the biggest thing that most people forget is they make people burn too many brain calories in mm. order to process. Mm -hmm. understand and remember your brand. So you have to have a brand simple enough. Just literally think of it as the scientific process of distillation, getting all of those extra stuff out to its most pure form. In its most pure form, what is your brand? Mm -hmm. And it should be two words or less, and it should be clear and intuitive. I should process it, understand it, and remember it. And this is one of those places where I feel like for me, when I sit in a room alone by myself trying to figure this out, I never get as far as when I get a group of intelligent people around me, even if it's a mastermind or someone like you, and we just sit down and it's like, okay, let's go over your thing and then let's go over my thing and let's brainstorm. So I think this is an activity because so many people lack clarity. If I were to ask them, what's the one thing your brand does or what I always give people the assignment when they join Ninja Bootcamp, which is my group coaching program, 25 reasons why people should hire you, you know, distill it down. Like let's get to the heart of it and they can come up with three. I take pretty pictures and I like people and I know my camera 
And it's like, that's not enough. That's what every other brand does. That's like the bare minimum of a photography business. You know, that's the bare minimum. So get in a room with people that you trust, start distilling it, start brainstorming, try different phrases out, try different things out. And it, it's so much easier than just locking yourself in a room and thinking you're going to come up with all the genius by yourself. Absolutely. I do the same thing. Even when I'm working on a huge company, I will sit down and pull people in and say, okay, here's what I'm thinking. How does it, you know, feel to you? Because, and that, and that's ultimately it comes back to what we've been talking about the whole time is you have to run these ideas by others. Cause it's not what you think. It's what yeah. they think. It's you what know? they think. Yeah. The best things that I did with a brand strategist was Brent. Yeah. He talked to three people in my life to say, what do you understand the brand to be? Not what I did. He asked me what I thought. And then he interviewed three other people. My sister, he wanted a friend who was kind of distance, but distant that I wasn't talking to every day, but saw what I was doing. And, um, and he really got that information and distilled it for me, took it and showed it to me. And I had such epiphanies of, okay, this is actually how I'm being perceived in regards to how I think I'm coming across. And that's such an important bridge to cross because most people think that they have a very clear knowledge of how they think people see what they're doing. And then they're always like, why is nobody booking for me? Why is nobody buying from me? I'm being so clear. And it's like, well, you might not be as clear as you think. Yeah. Exactly. You know, one um, practical solution for that is sit down with three or four of people who love your photography. I'm a huge fan of Darcy's photography. I talk about Darcy's photography all the time. I love it. So if she were to sit down with me, I could tell her why. Mm -hmm. Right. In a way that maybe you haven't had someone convey that to you before. And so one thing, if you're trying to figure out, okay, how do I distill? How do I distill is take your five top clients, people who Mm -hmm. just loved the results. I mean, screw the people who don't like you. We have enough of that in 2020. (laughs) Like take the five people who love you, sit down and say, I'll, you know, tell me why you, what are your five things you liked about your photography? Mm-hmm. And I promise you will have what, what you had, which is some epiphany of like, oh, I had no idea my mannerism and the way that I talked was really one of my selling points. You might mm-hmm. discover that. Mm-hmm. It's not even the end result. You might discover that it's because you're really easy to work with and you make people feel comfortable. That's equally as important in a photography session as the end results, right? You mm-hmm. might discover it's something else. So, you know, that's one takeaway from distilling things down. If you don't know how to distill it down, go to others. Mm-hmm. What are your five top biggest supporters and just ask them, tell me three things you like about my work, period. And take that information and think about it and then adjust. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Okay. Are we on four or five? I think five. We're on five. We're almost done. The last (laughs) brands make when they're trying to form their business. And you guys will love this because this is more about you guys, which is most brands will spend good money on brand strategy, will spend good money on website. And then when it comes to actually good design and marketing of that brand, like actually implementing that brand, they fall short. Mm. So the fifth biggest mistake that brands make is they get the strategy on point, they get the look and feel on point, they get the voice and tone on point, and they just don't invest enough in good design photography, content strategy, marketing. Once you have the good idea out there, does that idea run through your company culture? Does that Mm -hmm. idea run through every single omni-channel platform? Does that idea run through every talk you give? Are there specific talking points that every single person at the company is saying? You know, it's that brand implementation to make that consistency, to hit those talking points every single time. You know, we know the science that sometimes people need to hear things about seven times before Mm -hmm. it really sticks. So, that's why we, it's so important to be super omni-channel when it comes to good branding, because if they hear that same point of view in an interview, in a blog post, in a social media thing, in, a, in the packaging design, in the, you name it, if they're hearing it seven times, people know who you are. Yeah. So, you know, that last thing is some people do the good work of doing good brand strategy and they just forget to invest in good brand implementation. Mm-hmm. So the or last getting it in front of seven yes, people. Exactly. Yeah. So the last thing you have to remember is 
once you have good strategy, you have to invest money in getting that idea out. And that means good design. Designers who understand how to turn ideas into identity. That means brand identity, logos, avatars. That means investing in good photography, investing in people who understand how to turn ideas like bold, clean, and balanced into an actual campaign. Mm. Right. That takes an expert. It it's does. involving in good content strategy. It's involving in someone who understands how to do a website and then turn that into a Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, you know, to do omni channel, basically content that that you can do from a budget doing one shoot and then, you know, uh, producing once, publishing everywhere, right? It exactly. takes some strategy there to do that financially solvent. I've met very few people who have their ducks in a row enough to know their brand, to have it distilled, and then to invest correctly in all of the channels to push that brand out. Yeah. Yeah. I see that again and again, like people, especially photographers, they're like, Oh, that shoot didn't work. I just need to create another shoot and another shoot. And I remember people are like, Darcy, how did you grow so fast? And it was, well, I invested in one shoot in Ireland. And then I took that shoot and got it published in like seven different places. It took time. It took resources. We pinned it. We did all of these different things. I still reuse it. And it was that thing that I just, I was like, this is the strongest thing I've created. Everybody's going to see it. And everybody who at least has followed my brand knows this shoot. The shoot was done in 2013. It's still just as relevant to my brand as it is today. That's why I was very clear when I was shooting in 2013, the kind of photographer I was going to be. And I'm still that photographer today. And that changed everything. And so many people think, oh, I just tried to put this on Instagram a couple of times. No, nobody picked it up. Nobody really liked it. I must need to create something else. And it's like, no, you need to figure out a different place. You need to put some money behind it. You need to learn some strategy because what I know about my audience, the audience, hello, dear listeners, I think this is true. Most of them are so talented with their craft but they so struggle to then take what they've created, get it seen, have it be clear what they offer, not be shy to be seen. So many women, women, we've got to stop this, are like, I'm afraid to be seen. And I think, what? Then you can't be in business. Like we have to work over that fear because being in business, especially if you're kind of the face, which I am the face of my business, you can't hide and you have to be willing to put things out there that half the world is not going to like. Maybe 80% of the world is not going to like, but the 20 who do are going to be your loyal customers. You're going to serve them. You're going to create a tribe and it's going to fulfill your life. I cannot agree more. I completely agree with everything you're saying. Um, and that's part of the problem is you have this great product. I've seen this time and time again. We work so hard. We've developed this amazing campaign. And because the implementation is not in, in place, we don't make as big of a ripple effect as we have, right? Mm -hmm. But we have all these assets. And I think that I want people to really pay attention to what you just said, which is do something and do it really well and then use the shit out of it mm -hmm. <laughs> and think outside the box. That's my biggest advice to you. Think outside the box. There's a lot of earned media you can get that has nothing to do with that session, but that you could still promote your views. So you could do mm -hmm. medium articles, you could do interviews, you could show up and, you know, there's a million ways that you can get your product out there with a story that you're trying to tell that you're not thinking of right now. So yeah. if you have something you love, there's a reason you love it. It's core to your brand. Don't lose that. Figure out more ways to show more eyes. Mm -hmm. Period. Yep. yep. I'm getting ideas. I'm taking notes. And if I look distracted at all, it's only because this puppy is like... <laughs> I love it. I keep looking away because I'm like, don't touch that. <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> Recording podcasts with a brand new puppy. It's a good time. I um, love it. Such good ideas. You've given me so much inspiration. I think brands, you know, can always go deeper. They can always reinvent themselves. They can always get more clarity. I feel like every year I'm in business, I get even more clarity of where I want to focus, the difference I want to make in the world, how I want to put that out, the avenues of how to put that out, and also getting the help I need because sometimes everything that's required to do this, you can't 
do as one person. Right. And taking that leap to hire help, hire someone who can help get those articles out, be somebody who can help have the brand be seen is so valuable to growth. And it's something that I think women hesitate on a lot um, because they think they should be superwoman and do it all by themselves. Totally. I can't And they think that more. every other person who's thriving is doing it all by themselves, which is not true. <laughs> I can't agree more. And one um, just quick suggestion, and I know Darcy and I have done this in the past, is, you know, would one way avenue that I found successful is working with other female entrepreneurs. So working with Darcy for photography and she works with me for brand strategy yeah. or working with a friend who does video and I will give her free branding, mm -hmm. right? So that art kind of artistic bartering I've found with women actually does really well. It does we, so well. It does so well. We de genuinely want to help each other. We have knowledge that we want to give each other. And that's something that I don't see in other realms of business. And so if you are a woman in business, if you have good friends in business, like trading each other skills, resources, and knowledge for each to help each other's businesses grow is such a simple way to improve without um, being a huge investment. It's so true. All of us have such gifts. You have given me endless brand information, ideas, feedback, me being able to give you the gift of images of when you were getting married. And, and that was such a brilliant thing. I right now I'm getting massages for free um, because I'm trading a family session for her. And it's like, this is a win-win. I trade so much of my value because everybody wants good photos. And I have so many amazing resources who have such talents and doing those trades are key. Sorry, puppy. And that's key for me as a, like a, a working mother that's pr trying to pay the bills and build my business. I've often relied on, Hey, I can't, I cannot invest in a 10 K photographic campaign right now. It's just totally. not part of my thing, totally. but I can give you a hundred hours on branch edge, you know? So I think that thinking through, okay, here's my plan. Here's what I need. Here's what I want. And really getting to the place of knowing exactly what you need, who you are and how to convey that message. That's the biggest work after that, getting it across that's not a problem. You can find people who will work with you. You can find people who can convey that visually. You can find people who can figure out the SEO optimization, right? Mm -hmm. You can figure out the how-to. What I've learned is the biggest issue with people is figuring out who they are. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's why running your own business is so exciting because you can't hide from who you are anymore. <laughs> you have to get so much clarity around it and you have to step into that person you want to be and you have to like bring that kind of power every single day. And I think that we no longer live in a world where we can just kind of hide by the wayside and not get clarity on it because the world is demanding that we stand up, we take action, we are more aware of what role we want to play. The world's really ready for all of us to step up. And I think doing that in your brand creates a strong foundation for you. Then you make more money. Then you can help with the things that you really care about too, because money is still a very powerful currency in the way our world is structured. So yeah. Absolutely. That's it. Just that. Absolutely. Strong brands lead to healing the world. <laughs> That's a good circle. I have my shirt on. It says dare to change. The oh, world. I love that. I, I love only that. bought and it because I saw Jack. I'm wearing it. Oh, I, was like, I want that shirt. <laughs> I love him. <laughs> I love him. Awesome. Well, this has been so eye opening. You're so researched. You're so strategy. It's why I wanted to have you on the call because sometimes I think artists ignore proper strategies or ignore the value of research. One of my um, courses, the marketing map, the first thing I have them do is market research. And so many people don't take the time to do that. They're like, do I really need to research the competition and research this? And it's like, yes, you Biggest have deal. to know the playing field and you have to know where you rank on that so that you can have a clear path to the success that you want. So absolutely, I love it's all your facts and information and your research and everything. And we're going to link to all of your good stuff, to your TED talk, to everything that you've done because you are a brilliant, brilliant woman who I'm honored to know. And I'm so honored you were able to take time out of your busy schedule to be here and teach us these very valuable things. 
I will, I'm always here, girl. I know. Well, we'll see you next Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Chelsea. You're amazing. And good luck with everything. And I'm always here. I'm happy to do this anytime. Yay. You've been listening to the Play It Brave podcast. Love what you heard? Wonderful. You can shout about it in the reviews. I bet you know someone who needs a shot of self-belief. Then don't keep us a secret. If you've missed something crucial, we've got show notes for this and all past episodes over at darcybenincosa.com forward slash play it brave. Thanks for tuning in. But don't forget, the world teaches you to play it safe. Stand up, stand out and start playing it brave.